So, good morning again. Um, last week, we didn't do any calc to this. Um, I mean, those sections 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, those were prerequisite sections. Um, I'd like to start section, maybe just finish. We'll see. Section 2. Point one today, and section two point one doesn't use the use the word, but it introduces a major, um, at least the concept of a major definition in calculus. And uh, let's come at this definition. from a concrete direction. Let's look at the velocity of a moving object. So let's say that an object is launched into the air and you know its position function. You know its height. You might remember from, from high school physics or whatever that the height of an object launched upwards might be something like this. Here, time t is time in seconds, and this distance the object travels, I guess I should just say the height of the object is in meters. And let me think, I want... I want a T there as well. Um, so I said that calculus is the mathematics of change. And in the specific context of a moving object, asking how quick the object is moving is asking for the speed of the object. Or maybe we should say the velocity of the object. Those are slightly different things in a technical sense. So we've got this height function, and we want information about the velocity. Let's put down a concrete question, how fast is the object moving after one second. Let's try to approach this question. This will also give us an opportunity to sort of address how calculus works. I mean, that's a slightly informal statement. But calculus works via um, successive approximations. If there's some piece of information you want, you try to approximate it. And then you try to make your approximation better and better until your approximation stops being an approximation and just turns into an exact answer. So let's ask the question. Um, can we approximate 
the object speed after one second. Do we know any formula that would let us go from a statement about position to a statement about velocity? And, well, yes, or it would be a kind of useless to ask that question if the answer was no in college algebra or wherever you learn. An average rate of change formula if you've got a function and you've got an interval a comma b that you're working on the average rate of change of the function on the interval is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Is this form to the ringing bells for everyone? Well, again, if we're talking about a moving object and we're talking about the position of a moving object, then the rate the object is, the rate the position is changing at is the velocity of the object. So in this specific case we're looking at, we can scribble out average rate of change, and we can also give ourselves slightly more room to, to work with. And we can say this formula is an average velocity formula. And Instead of F, we're using S. This is tradition. Um, it comes from German, which, I mean, my pronunciation would be very bad, but strekt or something like that in German is the reason we use S for heights and position. So we can find the average velocity of an object over a period of time. And obviously that's not what we're asked for. We're asked for the exact velocity of the object at one moment in time. But let's find an average velocity. Let's find the average velocity between the first and the second second. So let's find the average velocity, the average rate of change on the interval one comma two. It's going to be S of two minus S of one. divided by 2 minus 1, and then this is going to get a little ugly because our, our formula is kind of ugly. We've got this negative 4.9, and we've got that square. 
So let me see if we can get this in our calculator. So negative 4.9 times 2 squared plus 100 times 2 So let's do this in pieces, just so I don't like mess up the, the PEMDIS on the calculator. This is f of 2 minus f of 1. I mean, some of this we could just do in our head. I mean, 1 squared is 1. A hundred times one is a hundred. But this is f of two minus f of one. And then the 2 minus 1 is easy. 2 minus 1 is 1. And we've got an average velocity. So this, again, this is not what we were asked for. We were asked for the exact velocity after one second. Well, do you think this average velocity is telling us anything at all? Like, we didn't select this interval at random. We want to know what happens at one second. We looked at what happened between the first second and the second second. And I mean, I think this is telling us something. Like, I think it's a very unlikely, based on this information, that the exact velocity we're looking for is a thousand meters per second. I think that if this average velocity between the first and the second second is 85.3, then the exact velocity at one second ought to be in the ballpark of 85.3. Maybe bigger, maybe smaller, but probably not one, probably not 500. Based on that line of reasoning, this 85.3 can be thought of as an approximation of the velocity that we're looking for. It's not going to be exactly it, but it's maybe going to be sort of in the ballpark. Based on that idea, does anybody have a suggestion of how we could get a better approximation? Well, that's fine. Let's ask ourselves, why is this just an approximation? Why is this not the velocity we're looking for? And the answer is that, well, between the first and the second second, the velocity changes. 
is, right? It, it, it decreases. The force of gravity starts pulling this object down. So over the course of this second, the velocity changes. If, if the velocity had less time to change, if instead of looking at the interval from one to two, we looked at the velocity between the first second and the one point first second. We looked at the average velocity over just a tenth of a second. It makes sense. It makes sense to me, and maybe that's just because I've taught this class like 10 times by now, but it makes sense to me that this average would be closer to the exact velocity that we're looking for. We are only have a tenth of a second, the velocity has less time to decrease, Gravity has less time to mess things up and change things. So we can look at messed that up. Let's fix it. We can look at um, this average velocity. Am I? Yep, I am recording. And this average velocity will hopefully be closer to the velocity at one second, to the velocity that we're looking for. And we can go to our calculator and we, now we've got negative 4.9 times 1.1 squared plus 100 times 1.1 minus negative 4.9 times 1 squared plus 100 times 1. Don't make a syntax error. So our um, numerator is 8.971. Our denominator is 0.1. Dividing by 0.1 just moves the decimal place over. So 89.71 meters per second. And if we buy that by changing that 2 to a 1.1, I have made this approximation better. We now have a general method for improving our approximation. If I want this approximation to be even better, what can I do? Go even closer to one. Go even closer to one. If I want this approximation to be better still, maybe I look at the average velocity over this interval.
And now let's see if we can, all of this is going to change. Let's see if we can do this without, uh, without totally re-entering everything. We'll pull this back up with the entry. One point. Now we'll insert zero, zero, one. One point. Insert zero, zero, one. This S of one, we're not changing. So we get this. Uh, point zero nine zero one nine five one. And this should be ninety. Point one nine five one. So the closer we make that number to one, the better our approximation gets, or at least that seems to be true. Um, why can't, if making that uh, number on the right closer to one makes our approximation better, why don't we just let it equal one? What would happen if we just let it equal one? We divide by zero. We'd get a division by zero error. We would get this in the denominator. So we have this situation where the closer that number gets to one, the better our approximation is, but we can't let it actually equal one. And this is the idea. The book doesn't do the, uh, say this word until next section, but let me just say it now a limit occurs when your variable, let's just say x here, must get closer and closer to some number, but cannot equal that number. And again, that's precisely what's happening here, where we've got, I mean, we're looking at <clears throat> intervals starting at one and going to some number, going to B, let's say. And this B should be getting closer and closer to one to make our approximation more and more accurate, but it can't equal. One. If it equals one, we get a division by zero error. Let's see if we can use this idea and let's see if we can try to answer to our satisfaction the question we asked which is what's the velocity at one? 
And um, it's possible that we're going to get, because of that decimal, negative 4.9, it's possible we're going to have ugly stuff and we need to factor it and we can't, and this problem will sort of peter out. But let's give it a go. We're looking. at the average rate of change over this interval. We're asking what happens as B gets closer and closer to one, but B isn't allowed to equal one. That would give us a division by zero error. S of B minus s of 1, all divided by b minus 1. Well, s of b is negative 4.9 b squared plus 100b, just taking this formula and plugging a B in there. S of one is something I should be able to do in my head. 100 minus 4.9. Um, 100 minus four is 96, minus another 0.9 is 95.1. And now I'm going to cheat. I'm going to see if we can use technology to factor this thing up here. I sure can't do it in my head. Let's see, I'm on Wolfram Alpha. It's not showing, if you're looking at this after the fact, it's not showing up because I haven't shared the screen yet. Let's see. Ew, it's not quite doing it. Let's, let's just explicitly tell Wolfram Alpha that I want it to factor this. Okay, here it is. Let me share this screen real quick so that it shows up on the video. Uh, I have no idea what's, what's going on behind the scenes to produce this 1x minus 1 point and then in gray times 1, but this is x minus 1. I don't know if, if Wolfram Alpha is trying to factor over the complex plane and not doing a great job or what's going on. But this is negative 4.9. I'm using B instead of X's because I thought, I mean, I, I thought maybe Wolfram Alpha would work better with X's than B's. So X minus 19.4082. So we now see, um, 
Again, obviously, we needed computer assistance. I'll show you an alternative form to the that might be nicer to work with in just a moment. But using Wolfram Alpha, we were able to factor that quadratic up in the top. And we were able to do some cancellation. That B minus 1 in the top, and that B minus 1 down below. And now you're letting B get closer and closer to 1. Up here, we wanted B to get closer and closer to 1, but B couldn't eat. If b equaled 1, we got a division by 0 error. Here, there's no reason anymore that b shouldn't be equal to 1. The division by 0 error has gone away. We get negative 4.9 times 1 minus 14 point nine zero eight two negative four point nine times one minus we should bring dry erase markers in so that I can keep track of this on a whiteboard. 14.9082. And is this what I expected to get? Well, it's what we did get. That's uh, Um, so if we buy all of this, and I mean, there was definitely this factoring step maybe is a little, well, Wolfram Alpha seems to be factoring for us, but it's doing it in a kind of weird way. But if we buy this, then stat 65.15018 ought to be what we're looking for. Because as B gets closer and closer to 1, this average velocity should be getting closer and closer to the exact velocity we're looking for. And via cancellation, we were able to let B get as close to 1 as, as it could get. We were able to let B equal 1, no longer get a division by 0 error, get this instead. So this is, this is the idea behind... Uh, behind what's called differential calculus. You, um, you want a rate of change, you approximate that rate of change using average rates of change, and your average rate of change you make better and better until it becomes exact. Now, we're not going to to do stuff like this exactly for all the semester. That would, that would get very tedious very fast. We're going to learn rules and stuff. 
But this is the idea behind calculus, behind differential calculus, and this is the idea behind a limit. Letting a quantity get closer and closer and closer to some number. Now, it, it worked kind of badly here. I mean, just on a actually doing it level, because we ended up with this ugly thing that we couldn't factor, and Wolfram Alpha maybe factor. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, there's an alternative to this, an alternative way of approaching this that looks more complicated when you see it, but actually tends to be nicer algebraically. Um, does anybody have any questions before I finish us off with that? So this alternative that I'm talking about Instead of going from 1 to B and letting B get closer and closer to 1, we could go from 1 to 1 plus H and let H get closer and closer to zero. Is it clear to everyone that these are two different ways of discussing the same idea? You know, if you have one and then you have some number close to one, 1.000013. That's the same as having 1, 1 plus some small number. So these are the same concept. The second one is in general, easier to work with than the first one. Let's, I mean, I say that, hopefully I'm not about to, to make a fool of myself, but But let's, again, repeat this process, only now let's approach it like this. We'll go from 1 to 1 plus h, and instead of letting that right-hand number get closer and closer to 1, we'll let h get closer and closer to 0. Now we're still looking at average rates of change. The average rate of change formula is still with this. You stick in the right end point, you stick in the left end point, you subtract them. In the denominator, you subtract the right and the left end points. You see some cancellation, that one and that negative one cancel in the denominator. So you're left with this. S of 1 plus h minus s of 1 over h. And just as before, before we couldn't uh, just plug 1 in there, where we'd get a division by 0 error. We get 1 minus 1. 
precise same idea here. We want h to be getting closer and closer to zero. But of course, if we let h be zero, we'd get a division by zero error. So I am missing a negative there. Negative 4.9 times 1 plus h squared. Let me separate this so my work doesn't run together. Plus 100 times 1 plus h minus s of 1. And S of 1 was, uh, we already did this, was 95.1. And now, I mean, that 4.9 is still not a nice number. There's no way to make any of this algebra truly appealing, but negative 4.9, we'll, uh, if hopefully you remember how to foil, or the, a few uh, chapters are going to be kind of rough on you. 1 plus 2h plus h squared plus 100 plus 100h minus 95.1 all divided by h. I regret that I used the same color font for that separating line as I used for the, uh, for writing the fraction. And now we'll, uh, we'll try to simplify this. I mean, I've promised that, that, that the algebra will be nicer here. It doesn't look nicer so far. But let's distribute this out. Negative 4.9 times 1. Negative 4.9 times 2h. Let's see. 0.9 times 2 is 1.8. Um, 4 times 2 is 8, negative 9.8 times h, negative 4.9 times h squared, plus 100, plus 100h, minus 95.1, all divided by h. And now something nice is happening. Uh, it probably doesn't look that way at first glance. It probably looks pretty all around unappealing. But this 100 and that negative 4.9 make 95.1. So those two numbers together cancel out that 95.1. And now the 
the thing that really is going to make this nicer than the last thing, and make me a lot more confident in my answer, is we've, um, we look at those terms up top. Uh, 9.8h, 4.9h squared, 100h, they've all got an h in them, we don't have to go to Wolfram Alpha to try to make this work. We can just pull an H out of the top. Uh, we could also, I, we could combine like terms here, that 100H and that negative 9.H. I didn't do that. So I'll just leave it be. And then that H up top and that H below cancel. And we want to know what happens as H gets closer and closer to zero. Well, previously we couldn't let H B is zero because we'd get the division by zero error. But now, I mean, we've got negative 9.8 minus 4.9H plus 100. What happens as H gets closer and closer to zero? Well, that just goes away. Negative 4.9 times a millionth, negative 4.9 times a billionth, negative 4.9 times a trillionth. That's just getting smaller and smaller and smaller the closer h gets to zero. And man. 100 minus 9 is 90, minus 0.8. Man, I absolutely knew it. The second I saw that 65, I was just cringing because I was like, that can't be right. We've already approximated this. We are getting approximations around 90. Our velocity has to be somewhere around 90. And that's what we are seeing here, 89.2. With two minutes left, I'm hardly going to troubleshoot the first uh, run through how, uh, how we messed up exactly. To get that. But I promised that even though this, you know, even though this maybe looks a little unnatural, I said it would be easier to deal with, and it was easier to deal with. And now we have to decide. <laughs> 